Okay, turn over to Genesis chapter 4. We'll begin a new chapter here. And while you're turning there, I just want to share a little, um, a little something about my past. Is that my, um, I don't know how many of you have, have had siblings, or have siblings, but I, had grown up, I had two uh, younger brothers. And both of them, uh, one was five years uh, younger than me, and the other one was about seven years younger than me. Now, the one that was about seven years younger than me, I never really uh, didn't mess with him much. I guess because he was just too much of a, a baby for me. But, but when one of those five years younger than me, I really abused him. I would probably say that I nowadays would probably call me a bully. I mean, I would beat up on him. I would torture him. I would do whatever I could to get under his skin. Because most of the time, he'd try to get me in trouble anyway. So if I'm going to get in trouble, I'm as fully give him everything I got. But one thing I can tell you though, no one else could pick on my brother. If someone would pick on my brother, I'm going to take up for him and I'm going to make sure that I protect him. I remember one time we were at camp and somebody had taken, he's a, he's a, he's a geek kind of thing. He, he loved taking things apart and then um, trying to put them back together. Sometimes he was successful, sometimes he got things to work without, with missing parts. I don't know how he did that. But, but anyway, he, we were at camp one time and, and someone had, and he wore glasses, um, and, and somebody broke his glasses and, and I said, who did it? So I went over and I took care of that person um, of, of doing those things. But, but those are the kind of things I did with my brother. Those were the things that, that uh, you did. You just did it as your brother, especially if you're the older one. Um, and, and even though we're, we're, gonna, we're, we're gonna be talking about some brothers today, it's not really the, the, the moral of the story. I just want to give you a little bit of background of, of what it was to have younger brothers who I could actually beat up, um, there. But anyway, enough of that. Um, what we're gonna do is we're starting this chapter four, and now we've already known that Adam and Eve, they've left the garden, right, uh, of Eden, and, and they're beginning a, a new and a very different life now. They've, they, they've, they're now living in a fallen World before it was creation, it was everything was perfect, everything was uh, everything was the greatest in the world. But now, because of of their sin, now um, we live in that fallen world. I mean, everything has changed, right? Animals have become hostile to not only Adam and Eve but to one another. Um, thorns and thistles have have replaced where uh, the, the once they were edible plants that you, that they had grown. And worst of all, there was something that was completely new, and that something new was suffering and death. They never saw it at that time before that. We do, what we don't know is we don't know how much time has passed from Adam and Eve leaving the garden to the birth of their first son. But, but it was probably no more than, uh, than a few years max. The Bible doesn't say, so I don't really want to speculate. And some have even said that Cain and Abel were even twins. Um, I don't think they were, um, but we don't know for sure. But in any case, they were pretty well close in age. Now, before we get into this chapter 4, we need to know that the context of this chapter suggests that God had explained to Adam and his family how to enter God's presence with proper sacrifices. Because in the last chapter, what happened? God made him, uh, God himself made the first animal sacrifice in the Garden of Eden as an example of what was required, the life of an innocent animal. And here's the thing, even though we've heard the account of, of Cain and Abel, um, and it contains a murder, well, I can tell you, this is not the focus. It's not about murder. Right? It's more about a person who is a murderer. Right? So, but, but if, you, if you're going to get technical, it's even more, more than that, really. It's, it's about God. In fact, that's what most of the whole Bible is about. It's about God. So whether I like it or not, it's also about me. And whether you like it or not, it's also about you. So today I want to share with you the, the progression of, of what we see of sin that comes from devaluing life and not giving true worship to our Lord. So I'm going to go ahead and read Genesis chapter 4, 1 through 16. So follow along with me. In your Bibles, if you have it with you. Because now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruits of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their, of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? 
And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to contrary to, to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to his able to, to Abel his brother, and, and, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. And verse 16 says, Then Cain went away from the prison of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you again for your word. We pray that you would bless the reading of your word today. And Father, I pray that you would bless this message, Lord, and bless the hear, hearers of it. So Father God, that we don't leave this place the same way we came in it. That, Father, we leave rejuvenated, excited to serve you and to worship you in a way that we haven't done in a while, maybe. And we ask this in your name. Amen. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to, uh, we're going to lead in progression, right? We're going to lead in this. So the first thing I wanted to share with you, simple stuff, is God bless Adam and Eve with children. Right? It says that in verse 1 and 2. Now, we have to keep in mind that this is a new experience for Eve. Right? There was no other woman around to tell her how, what was going to go on with her body, what was going to happen when she gave birth. Her only examples that she saw were the animals that were giving birth. That's the only example she had. So when she gave birth, she had made a comment and said, I have gotten a man with the help of of the Lord. And the name Cain it is a wordplay that basically means the word gotten or acquired or possession. And this may have, if you think about this, she's probably thinking at this particular time that this was a hope that the child would be fulfillment of God's promise of a son that would crush the serpent's head, which says in uh, verse 15 of chapter 3. So she's excited. She's thinking, okay, God's going to, God, fine, he's doing it. It's only been a few years. He's going to, he's bringing it and he's going to change. And bring the one who's going to cross the serpent's head. So we see right here that Eve knew that life comes from the Lord. But then she gave birth to Abel. And his name means breath or vapor. Right? Possibly by the time Abel came along, she's already realized that Cain was not going to be the promised redeemer. He wasn't going to be the one who was going to save them. So there is some significance in the name, uh, the previous use of Abel, like a vapor. We know he, was, he didn't last very long. And also the scripture says that Abel became, um, be, becomes a, a, a keeper of the flocks, right? He, he, he was a, sh- a sheep herder, and, and Cain became a tiller of ground, a farmer. And there is a significance, and I re- believe, I believe the reason why it's here is to show the occupations to be for the purpose of explaining the substance of their offerings. If you remember what Cain was doing was the same thing that God told Adam to do. Right? And I tell you this because the rejection of Cain's offering was not based on his profession. Right? And that we need to understand that. But then we see the second part, which is found in verses 3 through the beginning of 5. I'm just read that again just so we keep on track. It says, the course of time, so some time, some years have passed by. Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought the firstborn of his flocks of the fat for fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offerings, but for Cain's offering he had no regard. So here we go. We have Cain who he brings this 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 offering of fruit. Now, if you never read this account, if you didn't know much about it, you look at this and you say, at first at first glimpse. This is a legitimate act of, of, of worship of Cain's part. And you think, well, this is what he did for a living. This has got to be good, right? This is what you're thinking. I mean, he was a farmer, so it would have been natural for him to give a tithe of the produce to the Lord as an indication of his love and worship to God, right? You would think that. And Abel, same way. He, he, his off, his off, um, offering also seemed natural because Abel was a shepherd. So we can see those things. But here's the thing. We see that God... Regards or accepts Abel's offering, but not Cain's. Now, early on in my Christian walk, when I first read this, I can tell you, I asked the question, why? 
And some of you may have asked the same question. Why, why when you first, were, uh, first became a believer in Christ, you, you read Genesis, maybe they told me told you to read Genesis, and you got to this, you said, well, what's the deal, man? The, the offering, it's, it's a legitimate offering. Why does not God accept Cain's offering? And I'm sure, like I said, a lot of other Christians might have thought the same thing. And if we're not careful, what we start doing is we begin to stray from what this, tr- this account truly is all about. But why is it so important? Why was it so important for me to know why Cain's offering was not accepted? Why did it bother me so much? Because it really did bother me. See, why am I compelled to give uh, an explanation to a reason when this account really doesn't give us one? And here's something that we start to begin. This is where I start to begin to know something about God and about, and about ourselves if you think about it. The first thing that we learn, that God is God. I know, right? That seems like a, such an obvious statement. We all know that God is God. But think about it. God and God alone decides what offering He accepts and whose offering He accepts. He is God. He is free to do what He wants. The theological word here is sovereignty. Right? God is sovereign. That is, that God is the supreme authority and all things are under His control. He does not have to operate by any standards that we have set for Him or what might be our expectations of Him. He doesn't have to answer to us for His actions because He is God. And I'm not sure in our Christian culture today that we really grasp the significance of that. Especially today in our popular quote-unquote religious culture. We have chosen to have a small God. One that we can know. One that we can understand so that we we know exactly what He will do. See, we like that kind of God. Here's why. Because if we can understand God in that capacity and know everything about Him, and if we can casually chat with Him like we chat with a friend, then He's not much of a threat to us. The problem is, nowhere in this scripture, in this Bible, is God portrayed as that kind of God. I even think this is why some people would rather talk more about Jesus than about God. Somehow Jesus is more personable, more likable than God. That's why people love reading the New Testament, not the Old Testament. And there's a lot of theological issues with that statement. We just don't have time to get into it today. So I think we want to be... To me, I thought I wanted to be sure that, that I understood God enough that we would never have to risk our offering being rejected. See, we want to understand what went wrong with Cain, or I did anyway. So I can be sure I get it right. I want to know exactly what I have to do to make God happy. Because if I know that, then I can do the proper thing. I can get it right. I, I can, and God will smile on me. Because I certainly didn't want to be Cain. And before, we ha- before I even realized it, what happens is, and, and many other Christians probably the same way, we have slipped into an attitude toward God that bases our relationship with Him on proper actions as a condition of His blessing. We have reduced God to a vending machine that we just press a button and comes out what we like or what we want. So we worry about bringing the right sacrifice. We, we worry about obeying the rules properly. We, we, we want to pronounce all the names in the Bible correctly. We want to believe all the right things. We want to get all the quote-unquote religious stuff down pat. Because we assume that the quality of our worship or the kind of our sacrifice or the length of our prayers or the amount of tithe we give or how many times you come up to the altar, all that means something will cause God to be happy to us with, with us. See, again, we push the right buttons and God comes and out comes God's acceptance. See, some people call that legalistic. You know, you're worried more about the outside appearance than a personal inside relationship with with God. And we're legalistic when we think what we do is what makes us right before God. 
You see, a lot of us are afraid to trust God that we cannot anticipate. We don't know what His next move is going to be. We want to be able to control God so that we can use Him when necessary. And we're really afraid to admit that we really don't have control. Look, we're all human beings. We want to be in control. We want to have control of our situation. So we won't allow God to do anything about that. So let's not focus on why he didn't regard or respect the fruit. And let's worry about what is really is the matter here. You see, the problem was that Cain did not get to make the rules about what offerings was acceptable before God. He didn't have it. You make the rules up. Cain and Abel both knew what God required. But only Abel came in the obedience of faith with his offering. Cain, Cain came with the fruit of his own labor, but it was in defiance of what God had specified. So he ignored God's command and brought what he wanted. Look, remember what the Bible says in verse 4. And Abel also brought the first one of his flocks and of the fat portions. He chose the very first portion. And it makes it clear that his portion was sacrifice that shed their blood and died. And this is at the heart of God's chosen offering. As God just demonstrated in the Garden of Eden. But look at what Hebrews 9.22 says. Indeed, under law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. There's the thing also. I don't care if you believe that Jesus of the Bible. Everything but this. Wow. It's, he's not the only way. This right here, Scripture tells you, there's only one way. It's by the shed blood. It's like when we when God tells us to give our first fruits. What that shows us is our obedience to God, right? But more importantly, it shows that we trust Him with everything as we make a sacrifice when it comes to our tithe and our time and our talents. But why did Cain do that? Because his wrong offering was a root of pride. And pride <coughs> lies in waiting every fallen heart. See, this is what pride says. It whispers in your ear and says, You know what? You're a pretty good person. Sure, you've got your faults, right? But nothing so bad as to send you to hell. Hey, 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 do your best, be sincere, and, and you'll get into heaven. After all, God is good. He wouldn't condemn a decent person like you. And, and by the way, look at so and so. You're not as bad as they are. See, that kind of pride thinking is at the root of every human religion. We all have it. Sin nature. We have it. But it is totally opposed to biblical Christianity, which plainly says that we are all sinners by nature and by deed, and that no sinner can save himself from God's judgment. You see... If we, and, here, and this is the part we have to understand, if we can offer God anything for our salvation, then Christ didn't need to die as a substitute, or as Pastor Dale said last week, the propitiation for us sinners. If we can offer anything to Him to be the substitute, we didn't need Christ to die for us. God didn't accept Abel's offering. Out of, he didn't accept it because out of random unfairness. Like, you know what? Today, came, okay, sorry. I'm not like him. I'm not, I'm not doing it. And it, nor did he accept it because Abel was the best. Oh, Abel, man, that was the best. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. He didn't, it wasn't because of that. Abel was by nature just as much a sinner as Cain was. God accepted it because Abel's offered in faith in response to God's word. So it had nothing to do with Cain's efforts or Abel's efforts. It had everything to do with God's just requirement for a blood sacrifice to be the only means of approaching him. Let me give you an example. Most of you know, but every year I get to go to the I go to the college basketball final four. So let's just say one year that I decided I'm going to walk through the doors, and the person is getting my ticket says, "Who oh, where's your ticket?" And I say, ha, ha, 
I don't have one of those, those silly pieces of, of, of paper. But I want you to know, I am a committed basketball fan. I watch every game. I know the statistics on every player. There, there's no more dedicated fan than I. And what he's going to say? <coughs> you still need to get a ticket to get in. So I said, hey, alright. So I leave. I leave the stadium. I go and I go find an artist. Someone who's just drawing these things up. And I, and I, and I have him draw me a, a ticket with a picture of a basketball player on it. And, and he writes on it neat letters, Final Four, and, and, and a ticket. And so then I go back to the stadium and I hand the ticket to the, 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 the attendant and he goes, what's this? And I tell him, I says, well, that's my ticket. You said I needed a ticket to get in the game. Now, I could argue with him all day about my ticket is much neater and much prettier than the ticket you guys give out. I could do that with him, but that wouldn't do anything. I mean, I could tell him how much effort, and I mean, that, that ticket cost me some money to get that artist to do it. So all the expense I gave to him and for the ticket, he won't care. Because the only way to gain entrance to the game is to present the ticket that was issued by the proper authority. It's got nothing to do with my character. It has nothing to do with my dedication. It has nothing to do, as a fan, it has nothing to do with the effort or the expense that I went in order to produce my own version of it. But it has everything to do with being the ticket that's required by the NCAA to get into that game. And God has the only ticket into heaven is perfect righteousness. No one has it. No one can achieve it. But in His grace, God offers it as a free gift through the death of His Son. The only acceptable substitute. And it's the only ticket acceptable at heaven's gates. So we see that Cain didn't like it. He wasn't happy. His pride and his own efforts made him angry when his ticket was rejected. He was angry at God, but also at his brother. Because he got it by showing the right ticket. So his anger led him to depression. And in verse 5 says, and it says, his face fell. And that phrase suggests that there was some visible displeasure. So he grew jealous. And it all stemmed from his pride when he tried to come to God on his own terms. And sin stems from within. What is the clear in this passage, what is clear in this passage is that Cain's attitude was not right as demonstrated by his great anger when it became clear to him that God did not regard his offering. See, the proper response would have been repentance and seeking to correct whatever was done incorrectly. And we know from Hebrews 11, 4, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts and through his faith, through though he died, he still speaks. So as we give our offerings, whether it's our time, whether it's our talents, whether it's our tithe, God knows our hearts. He knows our attitude when we bring them. The third thing in this progression I'm going to share with you that we see the Lord's prerogative. The Lord's exclusive rights, part of his sovereignty. Latter part. I'm going to read verse 5 through 7. Again. But Cain, for his offering, he had no regard, so Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, the sin is crouched at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. I want you to first see this that Cain's anger is not betrayed here sin at the moment. Because we all get angry, right? We all get upset. But it's also equally clear that unless Cain just deals with his anger before God, it will become sin. His face fell, the scripture says. This was our first clue to the problem that underlined Cain's sin. He wanted his own way. He had a rebellious heart. Church, it is always, and I will say this a few times today, it's always about self when we go against God. Let me tell you something here. This is how great God is. His mercy. His grace. If somehow Cain 
was somewhat ignorant of the of, of animal sacrifices. Where he forgot a step, or he didn't do this, or, or whatever, right? Just something, if he just realized he, he made a mistake, he might have been embarrassed, but he wouldn't have been angry. If he had been sincere in his desire to please God, he would have found a way. He even maybe traded with his brother, but he would have found a way. You see, here's the thing. When a person who sincerely desires to please someone else does not become angry and sulky when they discover what is pleasing the person. In other words, if, 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 and this is especially true for husbands and wives. If, if, if you are going out and you're trying to please your spouse and something happens, she's not very happy about it, our tendency is to get angry, like Cain. But if our desire is to please her, we'll go out of our way to try to way to please her or him. See, and Cain had no desire to please God. None. But then in verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? The Lord questions Cain in the same manner he did Adam and Eve in the garden. The same way. You see, the Lord already knew the answers. He already knew this. But notice that God, once again, went out of his way to be reunited with mankind. Even speaking directly to the man who was in danger of sinning by wanting to help Cain identify the struggle that his stars was causing him and the sin that it could produce. Because what we do is we see God's grace here. Why are you angry? Instead of being repentant for a sinful disobedience, Cain was angry toward God, who he could not kill, and jealous of his brother, who he could kill. Think about it for a minute. How do you react when someone suggests that you've done something wrong? I want you to think about that. Do you move to correct the mistake? Or deny that you even need to correct it. You see, just as God demands the correct sacrifice, He also offers His grace and salvation to all. And if there's any question, any whatsoever question, about Cain's knowledge of what was pleasing to God, it was removed here, verse 7a. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do well, meant bringing the correct sacrifice before God. A sheep whose blood had been shed. If you had done it, would you have not been accepted? Cain, go back. Go get the right sacrifice. Come back to me. <coughs> nope. See, God was warning Cain that he or any of us do not have the right to enter his presence on our own terms. We must always come to God on his terms or will be denied access. There's only one way, there's only one road, not many to God, that is, and that is through the blood shed of Jesus. But then God goes on and says in verse 7b, still he's shown his mercy. He goes, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain's insistence on having his own way in the stubbornness. And then in the stubbornness led him into anger. And if he said, if you continue on this path, you would go through that door of anger and then you will go on to murder. When Cain refused, you start to see the downward spiral that began. And the rest of his life was an example of what happens to those who refuse to admit their sins. But it didn't start out that way. Look at James 1. 12 through 15. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. So just let you guys know that. God cannot tempt you. So when anyone says, well, God is tempting you, no. He's testing you, but he's not tempting you. He never tempts you to sin. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Just so you know, sometimes we stop reading there about being tempted by God. It tells you right there. But he goes on. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire or become ourself. We, we take God out of the equation and we do our thing our way. Then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. 
And then sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Here's Cain right here. Here's a lot of us right here. Just not Cain, a lot of us. Death doesn't always have to mean when you kill someone. When you let sin fester, when we let sin fester, it can lead to many things. Years ago, in California, I, I, I just read this story not too long ago, but it was years ago, that there was farmers who were threatened with a potential disaster in this, what they call the Mediterranean fruit fly. Now, and it probably entered the state through California, probably through Mexico and some, because every time you go through, you come across a border, they don't ask you if you have any fruit or anything in there, and you're not supposed to bring any fruit from another country in, right? So they probably got snuck in somehow, and it, so it crossed the border. But the but but the larvae which hatched and it, and it multiplied quickly in, in this fruit and, and it took this serious effort of California just to save the, the fruit crop. Now at the time I didn't know this, but 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 if, if the larvae of fruit flies and other insects they don't eat their way in to the fruit from the outside. What it does is the insect they lay the, their eggs in, in what they call the blossom, and then the fruit grows around it. So then, sometime later, that worm hatches and inside the fruit and it eats its way out. You see, sin's like that, right? It begins in a human heart and, and it, if unchecked, it works its way out into our thoughts. It works our way out into our words and in our deeds, our actions. And that's with this Mediterranean fruit fly. It, it takes quick and strong action to deal with it and root it out. So church, if you let it go, it, what happens is the sin gets the upper hand and, and results in, 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 in anything, terrible destruction. And we need to understand that the sin, the Bible says, desires us. See, think about that. You love it when your spouse desires you. You just love it. That's the same way sin it desires you. It loves you. It wants to take over. It wants to do whatever it can do. But God says, you can roll over it. You can roll over it. See, Cain had the choice. We have the choice. See, the devil cannot make you sin. The devil made me do it. No. You choose it. I choose it. See, when Genesis 4, 7 says that the sin is crossing the door of Cain's heart, if you will, it means that sin wants to overpower him. It means that it wants to defeat him and make him a slave of sin. Church, we cannot let this be us. We cannot let sin, because what happens is we become desensitized to what we really need to do. And that's sharing Jesus with other people. Not only just with, but in our own lives. We need to, we can become desensitized. So now we see the next part of the progression. We're going to see Cain's response to the Lord's prerogative. Look at verse 8. Cain spoke to Abel's brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. So we can see that Cain didn't listen to God. He didn't listen to his warning. And church, we do that all the time to God, don't we? If we're going to be honest with us, we do that all the time. God says, don't do this, don't do that, and we do it anyway. We just ignore Him. And I know, I'll speak for myself, I know I have done that. The Bible says Cain rose up. There's a significance in that. This is a physical action that Cain's heart has been exercising all along. He elevated himself. Right? He, he, he raising himself above his brother. He was consumed with self-will. He was raising his own will above God's. Hmm, who else do we know like that? Oh, that's right, Satan. This is the same attitude that led him to bring an unacceptable offering before God. But the Bible says his brother. Because he goes here, in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel. Not just Cain rose up against Abel, but Cain rose up against his brother. The phrase here emphasizes the personal and horrific nature of the crime. Listen, growing up, I told you I would beat my brother up. 
I was tearing him. But I couldn't kill him. We weren't Christians back then. I would have still want to kill them. Cain not only rose up, he gave the physical action, but he became personal. He didn't care. All he cared about was himself. And though we may not kill people physically, but we kill people spiritually when we above we think we're above them. Or anyone else. Lord said to Cain in verse 9, Where is every brother? He said, I don't know. I'm your brother's keeper. <coughs> we need to know the initial sin of, of Adam and Eve is not obeying God's command to refrain from eating the fruit of one particular tree. We know that, God, look, if you want to not be, you want to stay, you want to stay in the right, in right relationship with me, don't eat of this, don't take of this tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil. Don't do this. We know that. But we know that they're not doing it. This expanded into unjustified anger, hatred, and then what? Murder. All because of what Adam and Eve started. See, there's really no such thing as a small sin. Because one sin leads to another, and to another, which then multiplies and becomes more deadly. But, the great news is that we have a choice. We have a choice to break that pattern. But now we're going to see Cain's judgment. Next part is progression. It says judgment. Verse 9 to 12. He goes, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. I am, am, am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on earth. Again, the question that God here is rhetorical. And again, it's designed to give Cain another opportunity to confess. How many chances does God give us? But Cain, like his parents before him, what? He doesn't want to take the responsibility for what he's done. But here's the thing. Unlike his parents, there was no one else around to blame. He couldn't blame anyone else. So he, what did he do? He deliberately lies to God. See, this is the craziest thing. Lying to God is probably one of the most stupidest things we can do. Really. We think about that. See, I always tell people, I always say this all the time, years and years ago, you can lie to others, you can't lie to yourself. But unfortunately, I think now we get to the point now, we, can, we, lie, we lie so much, and I'm not talking about us here, I'm just, we as a, general, as, a, as a culture, we lie so much we believe our own lies. But what, what is, what, by lying though, it's commonly done because people don't really believe that God is, his, is who He says He is. Including being omniscient, right? No, God knows everything. He's, he knows about everything. and he, Nothing can be hidden from Him. You cannot lie to God. I used to tell the teenagers when I was teaching teenagers that, think about this. Your life is on a, a video, an audio video, 24-7. Imagine this. Imagine that. Just imagine this. That you have a, in heaven, of course I have no idea, but in heaven he's got a, it's a, it's a recorder going on and it plays and your life is on display 24-7, seven days a week. There's nothing you can do, even in your sleep, everything is monitored by God. Right? Think about that. Now, some of the teens will get a little grossed out because, ew, in the shower, you know. God knows everything. Nothing is hidden from him. So why would we want to lie to him? He already knows. He knew what happened to his brother. He knew what happened was going on. But he deliberately lied. But here's the great thing about God. Even though we lie to Him, even though we, we disobey Him, because we see throughout the whole entire Bible, we see God working to bring reconciliation with people. He's willing to reconcile with us. Here's a, and here's the craziest thing, and it, it took me the longest time to remember this. But had Cain confessed his sin at that moment, three times into it, he would have been restored to God. Yes, even after he killed his brother, murdered his brother. God would still would have restored him. You know, that was me. I ain't going to happen. I'm not, I ain't restoring nobody. <laughs> you, can, you can burn in hell. But God, that's why I'm not God. And that's why God is who he is. But see, Cain took it one step further. Not only didn't lie, but he denies any responsibility for his brother. Which is a challenge to God's right to question him about it. 
The result was that God made a direct accusation and judgment of Cain for the murder of his brother. Now, what we see in this reply, we see Cain's reply to God reveals in two ways who he really served. I don't know. Lie. He knew, and so did God. But this revealed who his true master was. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. Interesting. The word desire again. He was a murderer from the beginning. Interesting. And, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a li- liar and the father of lies. That sealed him. That sealed who he was lying with. But then he says, am I my brother's keeper? This reveals that he also served himself. In fact, it was Cain's self-serving nature that led him to murder his brother in the first place. And this is the ultimate goal in for everyone who rejects God's salvation plan. It's the ultimate plan. But like I said, even through this, God continued to show mercy and grace. We need to understand in this church that today, God permits His people to suffer under the hateful hand of this world. But we need to know that He is in control and He's well aware of all of your suffering. The curse that God gave Cain was different than what Adam faced. See, Adam faced was that his work would involve great labor as the earth resisted his efforts. But this goes a little step further. The ground would no longer cooperate with his efforts. Remember, he's a farmer. So he would have to become a fugitive and a wanderer, basically homeless. He would have to find food by gathering from wherever he could find it. In other words, Cain was driven from his occupation in a way that he would no longer be able to farm and, and consequently he was forced to wander. And guess what? Who does that also sound like? His spiritual father, right? Devil who wanders to and fro the earth. And this explains Cain's objection to the curse to begin with, why he whined and cried. Oh, it's just too hard for me. But we're going to see now the last part of the progression. This is the Lord's grace. And it's even a judgment. Starting in verse 13. Cain, Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have... And I, I'm sorry he's doing the whining voice. <laughs> God, my, my punishment is, is greater than I can bear. You can't do this to me. Behold, you've tripped me out today from the ground and, and from your face. I'm going to be hidden. I'll still be a fugitive. I'll be homeless. On the earth, and whoever finds me, and when they see me, they're, they're going to kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. So we look back at Cain's progression, right? He pouted, he sulked when he didn't get his way, then he threw a temper tantrum, right? But then he took it out of his frustration with his brother, and now we've seen him whining. And this is a pattern of behavior who think too high of themselves. This is an example we see in, today in people. They're all about themselves. Oh, I didn't get my way. I'm going to pout. I'm going to whine. So Cain's immediate response was that the punishment was too severe. But the reality is, technically, it was a merciful sentence for God. Because he could have required his life right then. This is what Cain does. Three things. Cain complains about not being able to farm and, ha- and, be- and having to be a fugitive and a wanderer. He, second, he, he complains that God's face would be hidden from him. Now listen to me. God never said that. Cain added that. And three, he worries that someone would, might kill him. These are the things that he's worried about. See, God, so what happens is God doesn't reduce the punishment. But he does address Cain's concern and his, and his fear, right? And as a fugitive wanderer, Cain would become a living example of the consequences of sin, as would his descendants, and we'll see that next week. And here's the thing, it would not be God that would hide from Cain, but it would be Cain who would hide from God. No different than Adam and Eve, they hid from God. Even today, it is not God that hides from us. But we that refuse to seek Him. 
See, God invites, but mankind refuses the invitation. Hebrews 11, 6, And without faith it is impossible to please Him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists, and He rewards those who seek Him. God says, I'm here for you. Just come to me. As Pastor Darrell was saying on Thursday night, or the church of Laodicea, Jesus is knocking on the door. The Laodicea is whittling him in. Jesus is knocking on the doors of those who don't know Him. And people won't let Him in. See, Jesus gives many invitations to all to come. The problem is not the invitation. It is our selfish and sinful desires so that He absolutely will not come to God on His own. Romans 3, 10 and 12 says, As it is written, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. And all have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Sin has made us a sinner. And we can't be saved on our own. But God also addressed Cain's final fear. Someone will kill me. And he placed a mark on him of some sort. Now, what do we know about this mark? Well, the Bible doesn't say some people have come up with some kind of uh, what they think it is, but I won't even entertain that because the Bible doesn't tell us. So whatever you've heard, they're making it up. But what I can tell you is the mark is not part of the curse. Right? It's a measure of protection and is intended to be a visible, visible reminder of the Lord's warning. See, to attack Cain... To kill Cain would risk the sevenfold vengeance of God. Now, it wouldn't have been death because you only die once. Right? But there was some curse or some curses that would have been seven times worse than what Cain was suffering. Imagine that. Cain was not going anywhere for a while. He was going to live out his natural life. And here's the craziest thing. All this stuff's going down. We have read the first 15 verses of this chapter. All this going down. And we you know what we don't see any of Cain's response was? Remorse. Not once. Then we end with a very tragic statement in verse 16. That Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. See, part of the consequence of sin is distance. In other words, we're separated with fellowship with God. And this is what happens with us when there is sin in our lives. People say, well, God's not answering me. Have you, are you living in sin? If you say yes, He's not answering because you haven't asked Him the one question. And that's, God, confess and repent. Please forgive me. Repent, 180. So if you're living in sin, God's not going to answer you. Now, He may answer your prayers through someone else, but not you. You have cut you off. It's, it's, you've all seen it. It's the fellowship. And when, this is it. This keeps us together, right? When we're incomplete. But when we sin, it breaks that fellowship. There's no more connection with God. And the only connection that's going to bring you back is, is confession and repentance. And I'm not saying this is God's Word. I'm not telling you anything that's, not, that's made up. This is all part of God's Word. See, it would be up to Cain to see that part he added, driven from the presence of the Lord, didn't happen. He would be up to him to do that by confessing and repenting. There are two foundational truths that we find in this passage. Let's listen carefully. Life is a gift from the Lord. Your life is a gift. Eve knew that when she got Cain and Abel. She knew that life was a gift. We need to know that too. Life is a gift. God can take you at any moment. God can take your children at any moment. You could not have been born. Life is a gift and we need to remember that. Number two, worship is a gift to the Lord. We need to know that we need to worship Him because He's given us life. And because of what He's done in our life. Do you, and I, you've heard me say this and I'm sure Pastor Earl, uh, Pastor Earl said it too. The only gift that you really needed from God was your salvation. He didn't have to do nothing else for you at all. Your salvation, you of receiving Him as your Lord and Savior, is the only gift that He ever had to give you. But He goes beyond that because He loves us so much. But here's the problem. Sin 
twist these two truths. See, in the passage, Cain devalued worship and he devalued life. He didn't care about his brother. It was all about self. So in return, he didn't care about God. He devalued the worship. I don't got to give worship to God. It's my way or the highway. And what happens in this passage is the consequences of misunderstanding these two fundamental truths. Number one is the failure to appreciate God's gift of life. And when we fail to, when we, when, when we fail to, to appreciate it, it devalues it. It devalues it. We don't think about other people. We think about ourselves because we don't care. But number two, the, fa- the, the failure to appreciate our gift of worship makes it easier to administer. When we don't worship God, when we're living in sin, we don't think about worshiping God. See, we look at God, like I said earlier, we look at God and we put Him in a little box. God, you're going to do what I want. It's a vending machine. I want this today and I want that tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work. So how can we, in closing, how can we apply this to us? First of all, the celebration of God's God's given life should cause us to give Him our worship. Just that you get to walk, just that you get to breathe air, just that you get to do things, should should want us to worship Him. See, wor- in this sense, worship means giving, but not all giving is worship. See, the Lord determines the worth and acceptability of our gift, and God knows our hearts. And if we do it out of a, a, a grudging heart. If we do anything like that, it's not true worship. And unacceptable worship comes from and leads to sin. And sin brings those consequences. Number one, the pain of consequences does not forgive us from the consequences of our sin. In other words, just because you feel guilty or you may be ashamed doesn't take away the sin that you have committed. Oh, I feel so bad I did wrong. I feel so bad I, 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 I made fun of, of who or so and so. I mean, glad I, I, that I argued with my spouse. I, I, no, that doesn't solve anything. The consequences of it does not forgive us. But number two, part of the consequence of sin is removal from the presence of the Lord. And we need to understand that. That if I'm in sin, I cannot have a right relationship with God because God is a righteous God and He only and He demands and is expected to be given that. But number three, we need to know that we are accountable for our sin. So there is the need for true, genuine repentance. So when God judges us for our disobedience, remember, it's meant to be to correct us and to restore our fellowship with our God. Let's not be a king. So confess and repent to get back where God wants you. And hopefully, that's also what you want, is to get in a right relationship with our Lord. Let's pray. Father, I don't know the people's hearts in this room, but you do. I don't know where they stand with your relationship with you, but you do. And that's all that matters. So, Father God, if there's anyone in here who doesn't even know you as their Savior, there is no way they communicate with you unless they ask for forgiveness of their sins. That the blood shed that you shed for them was the remission of sins. It was to remove our sins and make us white as snow. To make us pure. So I ask, Lord God, that today is the day. They don't put it off. They stop playing church and they start becoming part of the church. And they ask you into their lives. And we pray, Father God, if anyone has done that today, Lord, there's no special prayer about it. It's just repeating the scriptures and what you'd have them to do. But I pray that they would come to us and, and let Pastor Darrell and myself know that we can rejoice with them and help them along their path. But then there's others in here, Lord, that may not be they know you as their Savior, but they, they haven't been. They're, they're living in sin at the moment, whatever that may be. And, and I just pray, Father God, that they realize after today, Lord, they need to re- confess and repent and bring them back into the fellowship with you. Lord, again, I, I pray that they would come see their, Pastor Darrell or myself so that we can, again, rejoice with them and help them and encourage them and, and pray for them. 
And there's others here, Lord, that, that are on stride, man. They are on point with you. They're living, they're, they're living life the way you want to do it. And, and I praise them for that, Lord. But always know, Father, that even sin is still crossing out their door. So I praise you. Keep them alert. Keep them humble. And not be in the self-will that they have everything down. But they still know that they need you. Thank you, Father, for this great word that you have given us. Thank you for the, the Bible. Thank you for the scriptures that you've allowed us to, to be part of. Thank you for life. And I pray, Father God, as, as we appreciate the life you've given us, we return it with our worship to you. And we'll carefully give you all the glory you deserve. In your name we pray.